Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It is early in the morning. It's about 5.30. It's pitch black outside. I can hear the geese out there, and there's some owls in the trees, and it's just me. Tata's had his coffee, and he's off shaving or doing his morning routine, and Lisa's still resting, and um, we're excited about Thanksgiving coming up, and hope that you're just getting ready to have a beautiful day wherever you are. You're going to hear this uh, tomorrow, actually, on Self Brain Surgery Saturday, and I want to talk about two things that don't work and one thing that does work. And we're going to talk about willpower. We're going to talk about abstinence. We're going to talk about uh, habits and plans and purposes and systems and all those things. We're going to have a little scripture and a little music from Tommy Walker. He's got a great new album out, um, Soulful Scripture Songs. It's only available right now for download for uh, supporters of Tommy Walker Ministries. But it's coming soon, and it is something. I, I think it's his best work ever, frankly. Um, you know, I love Tommy Walker, and I'm always talking about his music and how how it helps me worship and i think it helps you too and tommy and i are going to sit down this afternoon on zoom and have a friday conversation that you'll hear next friday uh, today's friday conversation is up it's randy alcorn and it was an amazing talk that we had about the new earth and his new book but i found out about randy because of tommy and tommy mentioned randy alcorn's book happiness which turned out to really be helpful in forming my thoughts and writing my book hope is the first dose so it's just this beautiful um set of things that have come together from from connecting with people through the podcast and and um I'm excited to bring you those two guys Randy Alcorn and Tommy Walker two Fridays in a row um so today I want to talk about willpower and about habits and about we'll talk a little bit about alcohol but it's basically self brain surgery of two things that don't work and one thing that does work in changing your mind and so we're going to talk about all that stuff but before we get started i want to just address a couple of things first is this um somebody wrote in uh this week to the podcast and to the email uh lee at dr lee warren.com by the way if you ever want to chat or let me know something that you're thinking about you can always leave a voicemail speakpipe.com slash dr lee warren uh speakpipe.com slash dr lee warren you can tell me something in your own voice um and i'll respond to you um, but somebody wrote in and, and they were concerned about a couple of books that I mentioned on the podcast. And the, this person actually said, I can't believe you recommended Andrew Newberg's book. Um, I read it and he's all new age and he's not a Christian and he's talking about evolution and talking about, you know, all this new age philosophy and stuff. And, and so they were kind of offended that I put, um, that book on the show that I mentioned his book and felt that I could have led some people astray with that. And also that I mentioned Brene Brown's book. Uh, and so some of her books and some of the podcasts, and I just want to make something really clear to you. So the, first of all, if I talk about a book, it's not because necessarily I think that book, um, is all correct or that everything in it is beneficial to you. If you really listen to what I'm saying, I, I when I, when I bring up a book, it's either because I think it'll help you or because there's something in the book that I want to use to illustrate another point. So when I talked about Andrew Newberg's book, and I do hope to have him on the podcast someday, he is a, a neuroscience researcher and he's doing functional brain imaging and he's finding, able to prove what happens in people's brains neurochemically when they pray and meditate and, and there's all kinds of benefit to it. Now he and I look at that same data and we draw very different conclusions about it. And I think it's fascinating, the work that he's doing. But if you read his book, he draws a lot of conclusions that aren't about the, none of them are about the gospel or none of them are Christian in any way. And so I'm not saying those things to say that you should go read his book and find your path to God through it. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that when I recommend a book, there's a reason for it. And if you listen, you'll figure out what the reason for that is. But please don't ever think that every time I mention a book that I'm saying you should run around and buy it. I'll tell you if I think you should. But but I do I read widely. I think there's value in reading widely and learn from lots of people and, and just because I mention a book doesn't mean that I think it's gonna necessarily be something important to you in your spiritual formation. I'll tell you, if you read a Mark Rogap or Dane Ortland or Max Lucado or Philip Yancey or Randy Alcorn book, it's gonna help you in your relationship with God. But if you read Brene Brown, you're gonna read some good things about 
um, good ways to put some parts of your life together and good things to think about in terms of numbing behaviors and all those things. But I'm not going to suggest to you that Brene Brown will help you get closer to Jesus because her gospel and mine aren't the same. And so I'll tell you if I think a book has value for your spiritual formation, and I'll also tell you if I think a particular book has value. Um, Now we talk about Atomic Habits from James Clear. We talk about Never Split the Difference from Chris Voss. Those are not spiritual books. They're not. We talk about 10% happier. Those aren't spiritual books, and they're not going to lead you closer to the Lord. But there still can be value in reading them, right? So I just wanted to say that. Like, don't don't hear me mention a book and run out and buy it and then be disappointed if something in the book doesn't line up with your faith. Because I'm, I'm telling you right now, some of the books that I read aren't about spiritual things. Some of them are philosophical or business or or medicine or neuroscience, and they're not going to contain elements that will point you towards the cross, okay? But I'll tell you if they will. I just want to clear that up just so I don't want you to ever be disappointed if you read something and it doesn't, it has something in it that's offensive to you. Please don't think that that means that I'm trying to lead you astray or any of those things. And I've covered that ground pretty good. I'm sorry to spend a couple of minutes of time with you, but I just want to tell you that because I, I will tell you clearly if I think a book is one that you should buy. If I think there's a book that you really need to read, I'll tell you that. You won't have to guess. But if I mention a book in passing or tell you that I want to have a particular author on the show or whatever, hear me out and, and give me a little bit of benefit of the doubt that I'm going to use that conversation to help you in some meaningful way in your life, your spirit, your work, your family, your business. It's going to help you, okay? And I'll tell you why and how I think it's going to help you. So there you go. Okay, we're going to talk today about two things that don't work and one thing that does work. And we're going to get after some self-brain surgery. Listen, I'm always telling you, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And one thing you need to change your mind about is the idea that willpower is helpful to you. It's not. Willpower is not helpful to you. But neither are excessive focusing on rules and regulations, especially especially when you apply them in a religious context. I'll show you why those two things aren't helpful. I'll give you one thing that is helpful, and it will really give you the power to change your mind and change your life. And Lisa is going to tell us how we can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Okay, so I'm going to apologize in advance. I am incredibly stuffy this morning. I'm sneezing my head off. Don't know what's going on, but I'm real congested, and I'm sure my voice sounds weird, but... I just want to get that out of the way right now. If you hear me sniffle or whatever, I'm drinking some coffee, trying to get things cleared up. We had a long day in the OR yesterday. Damon and I and the team, Alan and Kristen, and just had a great team, Morgan and Tracy and Dylan and and, and Lourdes and everybody. Just had a great a great day in the OR and took good good care of some people and did some hard surgeries. And, and something occurred to me as I was operating that we, we use a technology called neuromonitoring when we're doing back surgery and brain surgery i need to know that the nerves and the spinal cord are okay i need to know that the, the procedure i'm doing isn't hurting you in some way that, that the spinal cord is is okay or getting better as i'm doing my work and not worse and so we use this technology called neuromonitoring we have a technician yesterday was alex these folks drive all the way from denver to provide these services for us to keep our patients safe they put wires in your skin and in your scalp, and we can run a little current up and down your spinal cord, and we can monitor the function of your nerves and muscles during the surgery and that really in your brain, and that really can help us keep you safer, right? Well, when we anesthetize somebody, when we put you to sleep for surgery, so one technique for 
anesthesia that makes surgery a lot easier is if they give you a paralytic drug that paralyzes your muscles and makes the muscles relax. And that makes surgery a lot easier on us, on the on the surgeons, because the muscles aren't fighting back against us when we cut them and use cautery on them. But the problem with paralysis, uh, with paralyzing drugs is that when we give you those drugs, it and it, it basically makes it where we can't monitor them. Because if you anesthetize a muscle too deeply, you put it to sleep and paralyze it, then it can't send impulses to the nerves, and the nerves can't send their impulses to the brain, and we can't monitor it. Because anesthetized and numbed muscles and nerves don't send the proper signals to the brain, so we can't monitor them. And so it's a balance between not giving the muscle too much relaxation and giving it too much. And in and, and that balance somewhere, we're able to, to allow the muscle to contract enough to send its signal. We're allowed to, uh, we are able to allow the nerve to send the signal properly so we can monitor. And what I thought about during surgery yesterday is I was struggling against this big farmer guy with really strong muscles. We're trying to retract to get down to the spine to put some screws in to take care of his problem with his back. And I'm thinking, man, it would be a lot easier if I could just paralyze this guy with muscle with medicine and it would be so so much easier but then i wouldn't be able to monitor him and it dawned on me that that's exactly the kind of the conversation we had when we talked to annie grace a couple of weeks ago on friday or last friday i think when we talked about alcohol and, and numbing behaviors in general like like some of us we deal with our stress we deal with our bad day we deal with our rough relationship we deal with our our grief or our loss or our pain or whatever by pouring alcohol into our bodies or, or putting drugs into our bodies or watching pornography or gambling online or buying and shopping or eating Cheetos or doing some kind of numbing behavior. And the problem with that numbing behavior is sure it gives us a few hours where we don't have to think about the thing that we don't want to think about, but we don't just get to paralyze that one muscle. We don't just get to numb that one nerve. When we, when we engage in numbing behaviors, it numbs the whole brain. It numbs the whole body. It numbs the whole heart. It numbs your entire emotional response. That's what I mentioned about Brene Brown's work. Is she's written extensively about this numbing behavior idea that you can't selectively numb things. And that's a great and powerful insight that can help you. Well, Annie Grace's whole work is, uh, most of her work's been about alcohol and the fact that one of the problems that people have with trying to reduce or eliminate alcohol from their lives is they have this cognitive dissonance built up about what it's going to do for them. So you have this idea that you need or deserve this drink because it's going to help you relax or help you be more engaging with other people or help you sleep or help you stop thinking about something that's hurting you. And so you have this value that you place on it that you think is, is a real thing that's going to that's important and that there's no other way to find that value and that somehow you deserve it and then it's going to help you and at the same time you're you're finding that you don't feel good the next day or you can't remember what you said or you embarrassed yourself in some way or you got yourself fired or you got a DUI or your wife finally left because she's tired of it or something and you, and you got some negative impact that this thing is having on you and those two things are in conflict and then when you try not to do the thing then you try to stop drinking or you stop eating Cheetos or whatever it is, when, when you try to not do the thing, you have to deal with this cognitive dissonance because part of your heart and part of your mind is split and you're saying, well, I really don't want to do it, but at the same time, I really need it or I'm losing out if I don't. I, you know, If I don't have this, then I'll cost myself some fun or some peace or some whatever, right? And so the secret to de dealing with cognitive dissonance is to get the cards on the table and to look critically at the truth about everything. So let's just, for a, for a second, let's just talk about alcohol as an example of that. And let me tell you a couple things that you need to know that you probably don't know if you're not paying real attention because alcohol has this incredible marketing. I mean, everybody's here, but you've got... Even if you've never touched a drop of alcohol in your life, you've seen thousands of commercials where people are laughing and they're happy and they're successful and they're getting the promotion or driving the sports car or getting with the beautiful woman or hooking up with the beautiful guy or whatever. It's because they had a beer and um, everything went great because they drank the right wine, right? They, they, they chose the right brand of, of tequila or whatever and everything worked out in their life. You've got all this marketing in your brain that makes you believe that the good life involves cracking up a cold, cracking open a cold one, 
right? You may not even realize it, but you do. You've got all that marketing and all this social pressure and all this, this, this societal peer pressure built up around this idea that alcohol is great unless you're one of those terrible people that can't control it, right? So everybody has that going on in their brain. So Annie Grace's life now is about helping people break that cognitive dissonance down. And she's got something called the Alcohol Experiment. I'll put a link in the show notes where you can sign up. And for 30 days, you can just join in with, with people all over the world who have just decided, I'm going to take 30 days here and I'm going to look at, look at alcohol a different way. And she gives you all these videos and, 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 and just evidence and, and information that will help you daily, every day. To, to just spend a little time thinking about your life in a different way that doesn't involve alcohol. Okay, so that's just something you can try if you're interested in getting this cognitive dissonance about alcohol out of the way. But I think it's a broader conversation because I think that's valuable. That idea of clearing out cognitive dissonance around things that we use to numb ourselves, I think that's extremely valuable. And this 30-day alcohol experiment may not be for you if you're not a person who drinks, but the concept of getting rid of cognitive dissonance is super important. I'm going to just give you a few medical facts about alcohol. We're talking about cell brain surgery. So if you change the way you think about alcohol and get the cards out on the table, then it will help you maybe break that chain and start thinking about it in a different way. Now, here's, here's just a couple of things. If you're under 21 years old, or if you have somebody that in your life that's under 21 years old, there is no, zero, absolutely no, rational reason why you would introduce alcohol into that brain because your brain is rapidly developing up to about 21. You're making new neurons and new synapses and alcohol is a direct neurotoxin. So if you put alcohol in that body at any dose, there's no safe dose at any dose, you are killing neurons and you are preventing synapses from forming and you are reducing your resilience to future resistance of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's and other problems that come later in life. So, so, Alcohol introduced to a developing brain is not good in any meaningful way. There is there is no health benefit. And if you're over 21 and you don't drink, there's no health benefit to beginning drinking. So all this data that's out there, all these stories, if you search, is wine good for my heart? Is wine good for my blood pressure? Is, is alcohol good for this or that? Every study that has purported to show a benefit, if you actually look at all of the data in co in, in, in conjunction with the big picture, there is no study that's ever actually shown an overall health benefit to alcohol at any dose. If you look at it, if you check who sponsored the study, check who benefits, follow the money, and you'll find that any study that purports to show a benefit in controlling diabetes or heart, uh, heart rate or, or blood pressure or cancer or any of those things, there is no benefit. Just trust me on that. You can go do the research yourself. Or you can read Annie Grace's book and see it, or you can go to the CDC's website and you can see. But the fact is, there is no health benefit to alcohol. Now, I mentioned when I did the ben- the uh, episode with Annie Grace recently, I made a statement that I said, there is no healthy relationship with alcohol. And Joel Miller, who's a great writer on Substack, by the way, has a great podcast too. Joel Miller's book review it comes out every week. I read his letter every week now. He's got a wonderful Substack. You should check out Miller's book review on Substack. But Joel wrote back and said, hey, I would just challenge you that, that there are some people that have a healthy relationship with alcohol. He talked about his family and their culture involved. They, they had some folks in their culture who you know, loved to have a glass of wine with dinner, and it was part of the family sort of societal thing, and, and everybody got together, and they have all these great memories about wonderful dinners with some wine and all that, and everybody did the, you know, kept it in appropriate proportions and all that. And he said that that was a healthy, good thing in our family. Well, let me just clarify what I meant by that. When I say there's no healthy relationship with alcohol, I don't mean that there are not people who can have one and walk away from it or who add value to their evening with a nice glass of wine or whatever. We've had some wonderful dinners with our best friends over the years with a glass of wine and a beautiful sunset. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no people who can have control of that situation. But what I mean by it is alcohol is not healthy. It doesn't help your health. It doesn't help your body. It actually directly harms your body in innumerable ways, and there's no safe dose of alcohol for your body. So you can have a little bit, and it won't kill you, and it won't be the end of the day. It won't be the end of your life or the end of your story. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you just look at alcohol as a drug, it is not a health food, and it's not a 
drug that does anything beneficial for your body, but it does do a number of negative things. And here's some of them. At least eight human cancers are directly linked to alcohol consumption at any level. Higher incidence of these cancers in people who drink alcohol at all. Breast, oral cancer, throat cancer, esophageal cancer, laryngeal cancer, liver cancer, colon cancer, and rectal cancer are all directly linked to any, any exposure to alcohol. High blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, and digestive problems all directly linked to any exposure to alcohol. Decreasing immune system function, increasing the chances of getting sick, learning and memory problems, dementia, poor school performance, mental health problems, depression, and anxiety, all much more common in people who use alcohol at any level. Social problems, family problems, job-related problems, unemployment, sexual assault on both the victim and the perpetrator side, all directly linked to alcohol use, okay? Which means if you drink alcohol in a social setting, you are more likely to be sexually assaulted. Now, that sounds terrible, and I'm not blaming the victim, but I'm saying that that people who get themselves in certain situations and they lower their ability to get themselves out of those situations or to make good decisions are increasing their risk of sexual assault. And young men, especially, who add alcohol to their systems are decreasing their frontal executive functions in their brain and making them more likely to commit a sexual assault. And college sexual assault perpetrators are generally not rapists and sociopaths. They're generally kids who got drunk and made bad decisions. And they're not, they weren't bad people. They just ruined their lives and somebody else's life because they decreased the function of their frontal lobe with alcohol. So just hear me. Why am I saying all this stuff? Not to tell you that it's a sin to drink a glass of wine. It's not. I'm telling you, if you're going to choose to make a decision to add a substance to your life, you need to do it with the cards on the table. And you need to get rid of the cognitive dissonance of saying this thing is going to help me because alcohol, in fact, it's been well studied, does not help you sleep. It actually hinders sleep in too high of a dose. It might help you fall asleep faster, but the sugar processing and all the things that are happening in your body are going to wake you up thirsty, dehydrated, with a headache, and not having slept well. Okay? It doesn't help you financially. It doesn't help you relationally. It doesn't help you professionally. It doesn't make you a better conversationalist. It doesn't make you more attractive to other people. These are all scientifically validated statements. So we're not talking about alcohol in this show, particularly today. I'm just, I'm using this as an example of how to get rid of cognitive dissonance. And here's how you get rid of it. You evaluate something that you feel like you want or need to do. And you say, what are the actual facts about this thing? And if you get the facts on the table and you decide, yes, okay, I understand the dangers, I understand the risks, I'm going to choose to engage in this behavior for this purpose, and I'm I'm being clear about why I'm doing it, and I'm going to be okay with that. And if there's some negative consequences, I'm going to understand that they were because of my decision making. Okay, And then that will help you make better decisions about whether and how often and how much you do something, right? So just in the example of alcohol, most people engage in that behavior without ever really looking at the truth about what it does or what it can do, what the health benefits or negative drawbacks are, right? So just get them on the table. Just get that on the table. And if you say, I feel stressed and I want to use alcohol as a way of managing stress, then ask yourself the next question, is there actually a better way to manage stress that doesn't have all these negative things? If my stomach hurts and I think a glass of wine will help, is there a better thing that might help it? Can I take some Pepto-Bismol and have my stomach feel better, and then the next day I don't feel bad because of the alcohol, right? So cognitively process those things and help yourself deal with it. Now, I told you I was going to talk about two things that don't work. One thing that doesn't work is something that we all call willpower. Willpower is this idea that we can just decide not to do something and we're going to exert our will to make sure that we don't do that thing. Well, the problem with willpower is you may be really strong and you may be a person who really, really, really has the ability to hold tight and not do things that you that you don't want to do. You may be an incredibly self-controlled person, but the problem with willpower is that willpower is a neurochemical event that depletes over the course of a day. And if you don't believe me, and this has been well studied and scientifically validated too, by the way, but if you don't believe me, just ask yourself this. If you're a person who likes to work out 
are you more likely to work out first thing in the morning or at the end of the day? And if you say, well, I got up a little bit late, so I'm going to hit the gym when I'm done with work today. How often at the end of the day do you say, I'm just too tired. I'm kind of worn out from work and I just don't have it in me and I'll work out tomorrow. If you don't hit that thing first thing in the morning, are you able to then make a good decision later on in that day? It's just been proven over and over that willpower depletes over the course of having to make numerous decisions a day. So how do you manage willpower? I'm going to put a good article in from Neuroscience News in the show notes. There's two types of sort of self-regulation. There's one called synchronic and one called diachronic. And synchronic self-regulation is this idea that we can exert willpower we can just decide not to do something and we can then manage ourselves and not do it. And so synchronic regulation is what you would traditionally call willpower. Researchers have kind of wondered what tools people successfully use to resist temptation, like overeating or drinking or whatever, checking Facebook too many times or playing video games and and why some people seem to have more self-control than others. And so they came up with this idea of what's what they call diachronic regulation, which is where you select and modify your situation and build your habits over time to avoid temptation. So, so rather than using willpower, you use systems and habits. We told you before, Atomic Habits from James Clear has been so successful because it teaches people that you're not likely to rise to the occasion and just be the superhuman when you're faced with a temptation. You're more likely to succeed when you build a system around what it is that you want to do or not do. And that's just true. So this diachronic regulation of yourself is where you say, okay, first thing in the morning, I don't want to have alcohol tonight. So how can I avoid having alcohol tonight? One, I'm going to say no to that event where I'll commonly have alcohol. I'm going to change my plan for the evening. Number two, I'm not going to have it in my house. Number three, if I find that when I sit and turn on a certain television show on the couch at a certain time every night, that's when I want to reach for a beer. Then I'm going to take a walk with my wife instead tonight at that time where I normally would be on the couch with with the trigger of having that thing. And instead I'm going to do something different. I'm going to schedule an alarm to go off on my phone at 449 that says, hey, don't you know, get off the couch and go for a walk right now. I'm going to tell a friend to make a phone call to me at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or whenever it is that I normally do that thing and say, hey, re- reminding you that you asked me to call you and tell you to take a walk tonight instead of having a glass of wine, right? Build a system. So, so it's setting it. Selena Samuela is a Peloton instructor that we use uh, on the treadmill a lot. And she has this thing that she says, set your intention and follow through. Like if we say, okay, I'm gonna, for the next 60 seconds, I'm going to run at eight miles an hour at a four degree incline. She says, set your intention before you change those settings on your treadmill and then do it. Like give yourself the gift of following through on something. So set your intention and follow through. That's diachronic regulation. Okay. You select something and you modify your situation and your habits so that you can be more successful at that thing. Synchronic, rather, is just this deliberate, willful willpower in the moment to resist temptation. It's like uh, Odysseus in uh, the Odyssey, right, where they're going to pass by the sirens in the water, and he and he knows he's going to give in to the siren song, so he tells his guys, hey, lash me to the mast, and y'all fill your ears with wax so you can't hear me screaming for you to help me. Don't cut me down from this mast until we're past that temptation, because he knows he's going to want to give in to the siren song. So he sets, he's, he's not going to be able to rely on willpower, so he lashes himself to the pole, and just goes through it, right? He guts it out. So that's kind of willpower, this idea that you can just gut it out or do something to make sure that you have to gut it out. And that instead of this other idea, which is setting an intention and building a system and a life around how you can be more successful. The problem with Odysseus's plan is when you get past the sirens and they cut you down from the mast finally, you're going to still wish you had gone and obeyed the siren song. He's still got it in his heart that it would have been a good thing for him to go over there. And you've got to get that that cognitive dissonance out of your head, friend, and I do too, where we actually, the next day, we look back and say, I am glad that I didn't do that thing. I am glad that I feel better today. It was a good decision. It was wise. It was the right thing for me not to have opened that bag of chips or clicked on that website or spent that money or been with that person or drank that drink. It was the best thing. And then that next day you'll say, Hey, I set my intention and I followed through and I feel better for it. My stomach doesn't hurt. I don't have a headache. I'm not late to work. All those things. And you then start building some cognitive 
some some benefit and some and some uh, pat yourself on the back sort of pride over the fact that you are stronger and healthier and wiser than you were yesterday. Instead of man, I really wish I had done that or really need that. So tonight I'm going to do it. I can't. I can't go another day. I've got to have that thing right. So. Annie Grace's approach to alcohol was one of getting rid of cognitive dissonance. This idea of willpower being a depletable resource of willpower does not work. And Annie Grace said, using willpower to try to stop drinking alcohol is like trying to cut down a tree with a spoon. It's the wrong tool. Well, let me tell you another wrong tool. The religious people, Christians especially, I don't know, I shouldn't say especially, but Christians have this idea that we can set all these these behavioral rules. God doesn't want me to do this or that or the other thing. It's, it's wrong for me. It's simple for me to do this or that or eat this or drink that. Well, Paul addressed that in Colossians chapter 2. Down at the end, there was a group of Christians who were really strict and say, you can't, you can't enjoy food, you can't enjoy wine, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and basically, they set all these rules, and the problem is that people weren't able to follow them. And then when you can't follow the rules, you get shame and guilt and this sense of failure, and that produces even more of the bad behavior because you just give up and decide that you're you're unable to succeed. And starting in verse 20 of Colossians chapter 2, Paul said, I'm sorry, verse 21, Paul said this, people say they have these regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. And here's 23, verse 23 of Colossians 2, Paul says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You get that? Paul's saying that having these rules and regulations that you put in place for yourself they seem wise but they don't help you change they, they they seem wise don't drink alcohol don't eat this don't do that don't open the chips don't click on the website you just put all these rules on yourself but they don't actually stop you from doing the thing that you don't want to do that's what the whole verse the whole chapter of Romans 7 is about what Paul says I really want to do this but I fail and I don't want to do that and I do it anyway and I just can't stop doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things I do want to do and then he ends that chapter by saying who will save me from this body of sin and death and then the answer is praise be to God Jesus Christ and the whole next chapter Romans 8 is about what your life looks like when the Holy Spirit gets involved. We talk about the fruits of the spirit and one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control and we talk about self-control and we almost all think that means willpower. But I'm going to give you the secret today. There's two things that don't work are harsh rules and regulations especially when you sort of attach a spiritual connotation to them, they don't work in restraining your indulgences. And willpower doesn't work, friend. It doesn't. And the reason it doesn't work is usually related to cognitive dissonance. Okay? So we're going to get our cards on the table about the things that we don't want to do. We're going to do some self-brain surgery right now. The two things that don't work, willpower and harsh rules and regulations. And here's the thing that does work. Systems and following through the self brain surgery of changing what you want, and you'll actually start getting what you want. The Psalm thirty seven four says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart." So the the secret to getting over alcohol or anything else that you're enslaved to, or that seems to be a a, a problem for you that you can't can't avoid and can't stop, and and an indulgence that you can't seem to get rid of. The secret is to learn how to want something else more. And I've told you before, one of the things Lisa and I talk about, love tomorrow more. Like, like uh, stop paying this tax on yesterday because you love tomorrow more. Start looking forward to how you're going to feel the next day if you choose a different path today. So like Selena says, set your intention and follow through, right? Start looking forward to tomorrow more. If you love tomorrow more, then you'll make better decisions tonight. So Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of the heart. This is the secret. Instead of setting harsh rules, is to say to the Lord, help me thirst for something better that will make me feel better instead of worse. Help me, help me think about my life differently. Help me find a different path to take so that I stop wanting these things so that always end up hurting me. Help me want something different. Help me be hungry for something that will actually satisfy me. And so the promise that Jesus makes is not that he'll give you everything you ever wanted. He promises you that if you want the right stuff, he'll help you have it. 
that he will delight your heart if you delight yourself in him. And so the secret is not harsh treatment of the body and knuckling it out like Odysseus and lashing yourself to the mast and just going through it and gutting it out and then regretting that you didn't get to go to the sirens and, and enjoy their song. That's not the secret. It will never produce happiness. If you want to become healthier and feel better and be happier, friend, you got to start using some tools that actually help. And the first one is get your cards on the table and look critically and honestly at what this thing is that you're using to numb yourself. And just like my patients, when we're trying to monitor their muscles, if we give ourselves too much medicine, we can't get the value of the benefit of monitoring them and keep them safe, right? You can't feel any part of your life if you're numbing some part of it because you can't selectively numb it. You have to numb all of it. You have to put the whole thing to sleep if you want the muscles to relax enough to retract them in surgery. And if you want to monitor, though, you've got to let those muscles contract. And if you want to feel your life, if you want to live your life fully, if you want to experience everything that God has in store for you, you can't be numbing yourself with anything. And so the self-brain surgery is stop thinking that willpower is helpful to you. It's not. Get your cards on the table. Clear up all that cognitive dissonance. And if you decide to do something, do it in the light of knowing the facts about it and accepting the consequences for the behavior that you choose and being okay with that because you chose it with a full, clear eye full, clear assessment of the facts. If you're going to do something, do it with no cognitive dissonance and get after it. If you want to get rid of alcohol or anything else that's giving you a hard time in your life, ask God to help you change the desires that you have. He gets a promise that he makes. I will help you want different things, friend. I will help you be thirsty for different stuff. I'll help you be hungry for different stuff, and I'll give it to you. I will never leave you lacking. Delight yourself in me, he says. I'll give you the desires of your heart. Set your intention, friend. And follow through. I'm going to give you a song that because of the promise is if we ask him, Jesus says, he will give you. If you ask, you will get. And what he's saying is if you ask me for the stuff that I already want to give you, I will always give it to you. You ask me to win the super lotto, I may not give that to you because that might not be good for you. But if you ask me to give you the good things that I already have in my heart to give you, I will always give them. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, friend. Stop trying to chop down the tree with a spoon. Get rid of this idea that you need self-control and willpower. And rather, set your intention and follow through and seek something better to be hungry and thirsty for. In the first place, that's some good self-brain surgery, my friend. I'm going to give you Tommy Walker's song, Ask and it will be given to you. Because you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is, you can start today. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Hey, ask, it will be given to you. Seek and you are gonna find. And knock and the door will be open to you, to you. Ask, it will be given.
Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.